Okay, so if you Google the migrant crisis uh, at the moment, you will be faced with some headlines that read, uh, the migrant crisis is unsustainable, uh, a worsening migrant crisis in the Americas, uh, and New York City declares emergency over the migrant crisis. And if you open these articles, then you tend to find very little insight into the conditions that migrants are facing. Uh, and instead, you see more of a concern for whether or not there is enough room for them. And um, whilst 281 million migrants were counted in 2020, which is apparently close to 1 in 30 people, uh, the actual number is undoubtedly much higher. You know, the figures are hard to come by, uh, and most importantly, to, uh, due to what politicians like to call tighter border security, uh, more and more migrants find themselves having to uh, enter countries illegally and will often be excluded from these statistics. And across the world, what we're seeing uh, are imperialist wars, political instability, uh, destitution, debt, poverty, severe weather phenomena like colossal floods uh, and wildfires due to climate change. Uh, and these are just some of the factors that are driving uh, the necessity for millions to flee in search of a better life. Uh, so the decision to, to leave your home uh, really is a last resort and millions are forced to come to terms with this, to uproot their lives, uh, to leave their friends, their families, their habits and so on behind them. So what we're talking about today is the fact that the lives of millions of people are completely at the whims of the capitalist system and its profit thirsty representatives. So in Yemen, for, for instance, a war has been taking place for about the last seven years. Uh, this war is led by Saudi Arabia, uh, which is using Yemen to avoid uh, Iranian influence extending over the country, which would become a threat to the international oil, oil trade, uh, which passes uh, the coast of Yemen, and the imperialist powers like the US and the UK uh, have actually supplied bombs and weapons to the Saudi Arabian military uh, to help to bolster these efforts. So what this means is that the regional powers in the Middle East and you know, their imperialist friends uh, are only really interested in upholding you know, the profits and the privileges uh, that, that they have. Whilst infrastructure, um, housing, factories and so on are completely destroyed um, and the UN estimates that this war so far has led to over 6 million people having to flee. And we should note as well that in this climate uh, there can be a strengthening of fundamentalist groups who kind of position themselves as anti-imperialist uh, and are able to rally some level of support behind them, uh, given the absolute hatred towards you know, the barbaric actions of imperialism. And the actions of these fundamentalist groups can then cause a kind of further necessity to flee. So what migrants have faced uh, that drove them to leave home and the journey after is, is more often than not very traumatic. Um, and in the face of, of tightening border controls in Europe, for instance, more and more migrants are, are having to seek these illegal uh, routes to complete their journey. These routes make it very costly and very dangerous. Uh, last, no uh, last year in November, for example, there's the case of 27 men, women and children who drowned in the channel. And then just a month after that, uh, there were two boats carrying 160 people from Libya to Europe, which drowned and it killed everyone. Many also disappear en route, held by human traffickers, uh, held hostage to work in exchange uh, for passage on a boat. Women are also put in positions of, of prostitution. Uh, men, women and children are, are beaten and they're brutalised. And then they are faced with the uh, hostile environment that the international community has created for them. So uh, we can look at Greece's prison-like camps in the Aegean Islands, uh, paid for by the EU in a deal set up in 2019 where migrant arrivals are screened to make sure uh, they are not terrorists. Uh, and some of these camps have such poor conditions that, for example, one 
in Greece in 2020 suffered from a catastrophic fire. And while six refugees <coughs> were uh, actually arrested for starting this fire, what the authorities left out uh, was that the like, fire in general was a necessity of life in this camp, particularly uh, for surviving the cold in the winter. But of course, uh, in an overcrowded camp, you know, filled with rubbish, it, it did become a fire hazard. And uh, in Britain, just last year, we had the, the Nationality and Borders Bill pushed through Parliament by the Tories. This bill fragments uh, the asylum process, uh, and only those who, who reach the UK through kind of legal means uh, will be protected by the 1951 Refugee Convention. And even if you are able to claim asylum uh, for migrants living in this country since 2014, uh, the Home Office has had the right to strip uh, people with or without a dual citizens, uh, citizenship of their right to a British citizenship. So it, it could leave them stateless. And this bill is framed in such a way that it actually removes the citizenship of those deemed a threat to uh, the public good. And we also have the 1971 Immigration Act, uh, which amongst many things allows um, migrants to be detained uh, for immigration purposes. And there's actually no longer any limit to how long someone can be detained for. And these immigration acts have sought to extend the strength of the state apparatus uh, by giving landlords, businesses, and things like the NHS uh, the ability to act as part of the UK border force, uh, facing basically severe fines if they don't kind of vet their employees and their tenants enough to make sure that they are basically here legally. So the politicians cloak these policies in phrases like uh, migrant flows need to be managed, we need to take back control of our borders, uh, and the latest one by the Tories is that the UK has too many uh, low-skilled workers and that international students often bring dependents. Um, in Denmark as well, there's a, a jewellery law that was announced in, in 2016 uh, when it was facing an increase in, in migration, largely due to uh, people fleeing from war in Syria. Uh, and this law is used to confiscate assets from refugees. So, Asylum seekers are allowed to keep up to the equivalent of £1,000 in cash and in valuables, uh, but anything above this will be confiscated, apparently to pay for their stay in the country. So we should be very clear, what underlies all of these policies uh, is racism and xenophobia uh, and nationalism, which is all whipped up uh, to divide workers, to encourage division on the basis of us and them, uh, and point the finger at a scapegoat for our most pressing problems, such as you know, supposedly taking up too much housing, too many hospital beds, driving down wages, uh, causing unemployment, uh, and also taking up too many spots at, at schools and universities. But these divisions can also be more subtle, uh, which shows how the politicians representing the capitalist system use the migration question uh, in different ways, depending on their purposes, uh, for their purposes, sorry. So we can see this, uh, for example, with uh, Ukrainian refugees and the fact that you know, fortress Europe flew out of the window overnight at the start of the war in Ukraine. Uh, for instance, the EU prepared a blanket right to uh, stay, to study and work throughout its 27 nations for up to three years. And we should compare this with the absolutely disgusting treatment uh, of migrants in Europe over the last uh, decade where you know, millions have been spent on brutally repelling migrants from uh, its borders. And uh, to, to use an example, French President Macron, uh, he referred to refugees fleeing from the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan uh, last year as potential illegal threats, uh, adding that France would only welcome refugees who share our values. So we should make absolutely no mistake, the ruling classes did not find an ounce of humanitarianism overnight, 
they made this uh, distinction in a cynical move to shore up public opinion behind NATO and Western imperialism, rallying support for Qatar's who, you know, in words, sought to defend Ukraine in an attempt to further weaken Russia's influence. And this is not the first time that European governments have tried to distinguish between you know, legitimate and illegitimate migrants. Uh, they've done this through uh, changing from legitimizing economic migrants, for example, who at one point boost the economy versus political refugees versus illegal migrants and, and so on. So Marxists uh, are internationalists and we are firmly against any barriers for migration. And Marx ends the Communist Manifesto with the slogan of workers of the world unite. And this was not kind of added on a, on a whim, but it was deliberate and it is the starting point for all Marxists. Now, um, to understand why this is the case, uh, we can look at borders and the nation state uh, to understand how they have come about. Uh, and I should add that Marxists don't see anything as fixed. Uh, in order to understand something and, and to look at where it came from, uh, we need to see you know, what processes feed into it, brought it into being in the first place. So uh, nation states and the borders that define them, they haven't always existed and they are actually only the product of the historical development of capitalism uh, over the last like 200 years or so. Um, small scale production uh, and local markets were kind of the embryonic form of capitalism and the early bourgeoisie needed to overcome the limits of local restrictions to trade. So overcoming the limits of local currencies, local rules and regulations, um, things like local law and order. And this is because they were striving to remove barriers for the production, the circulation and the exchange uh, of goods. So in other words, they were trying to remove any barriers to the accumulation of capital which led to the emergence of a national market as opposed to these kind of fragmented markets across the land. And they needed borders to be able to define this. So um, what this shows us is that the capitalist classes have, uh, you know, across the world, held uh, a kind of monopoly over borders, using them to facilitate capital circulation. And they are able to close and open borders on this basis. And this was really a giant leap forward in the development of capitalism. It, it acted as a stimulus for the development of national economies, uh, you know, strengthening the productive capacity of nations, harnessing more resources, greater technology, uh, you know, tearing laborers away from the land and into factories, bringing more and more people together uh, under one roof, uh, roof with common interests. So this also helped to lay the basis for class struggle. And um, running parallel to uh, the rise of these national economies, uh, there was a gradual development of national consciousness. So uh, in Britain, in the late end of the Middle Ages, uh, the wool trade dominated in a lot of areas. <clears throat> And this would have tied together uh, a large proportion of labourers who would be using the same skills to, to put food on the table, um, facing you know, the same conditions. And um, there is, of course, uh, because of this, I think, some truth to the fact that uh, you know, holding a sense of, of nationality and the traditions and cultures and, and habits that come with living in a particular place in the world is, is a reality, right? But capitalism is no longer in its period of ascent. It relies on the free movement of capital uh, because it cannot rely on its uh, kind of narrow limit of the nation state and staying within a home market. And the development of imperialism shows us this. It also explains why, for example, um, in the post-war boom, when the capitalist classes were uh, looking to expand and develop industry after the war, uh, Britain actually opened up its borders to its colonies in the Commonwealth, uh, with the Windrush generation representing the need for an increase in labour from abroad. 
So this has led to a breakdown of the material basis uh, for, uh, sorry, this has led to a, to a material basis for the breakdown <coughs> of national barriers. Uh, it has brought workers of different nations side by side together in factories, as it has brought catalysts side by side from joint stock companies uh, together as well. So capitalism has adapted to the flow of migrants and uh, because of this it, it is able to kind of facilitate what it needs. And we should be clear that the difference of nationalities is used as a tool by the ruling classes uh, to basically divide the working class and keep it at bay. Now, um, we say that the, the ruling ideas of every nation are uh, the ideas of the ruling class. The political representatives of nations, uh, the media funded by the capitalist press, um, by the capitalist class, sorry, not the capitalist press, and, and the education systems and, and so on. Um, these things are, are used to basically uh, like put forward differences of, of nationality and language, skin colour, cultures and so on in a reactionary way uh, to distract workers in an endeavour to keep them disunited. And this has cynical political motivations, you know, rather than it just being the case of uh, the classes, classes genuinely wanting to, to close off their borders and live completely isolated from the rest of the global economy. So uh, the change in the Windrush uh, generation, for example, was an attempt to stir up this racism with the 1971 Immigration Act, ending the permanent right to remain uh, for Commonwealth citizens. And this racism is an expression of the economic needs of the ruling class. They, you know, they are, of course, still racist, uh, but there is a source to this racism. And uh, in certain periods, they are more welcoming of migrants. So some Tory MPs in the past, for example, have been pro-immigration because uh, you know, they see the role that migrant labour plays in the economy uh, and they want Britain to remain competitive in the global market. Even Liz Truss, uh, just last month, apparently she was uh, looking to lift the cap uh, of immigration restrictions for seasonal agricultural workers uh, and broadband engineers in order to try and fill job vacancies. This being said though, uh, of course this, this racism, xenophobia, this nationalism is always kind of in, it's always there, uh, but at some points it is pushed to the, to the fore, uh, depending on what the needs of the ruling class is. And again, we can see this for example, with the change in immigration acts in this country. Now, in Britain, uh, we have just lived through the attempt of the ruling class to whip up this idea of Britishness and, you know, all belonging to one nation uh, with the death of the Queen and national mourning. But if we actually follow this logic and we ask ourselves, you know, what does it mean to be British, then we find that the answer is, is completely superficial. Um, it, you know, it's a complete fiction to say that people who have uh, a British passport, you know, everyone who has a British passport is exactly the same, uh, with the same interests. Uh, we can't say that Richard Branson, for example, who was a CEO and billionaire, has, uh, you know, is the same, like, socially, economically, politically, and psychologically as a single mother uh, on benefits working in London. So it's a lie that a capitalist and a worker have the same interests just because uh, they are both British. They don't share anything in common. So nationalism is used as a tool to paint over the cracks by the ruling class. And uh, you know, with this example of the monarchy, they were seeking to paint over the cracks that, that exist in the monarchy, you know, with scandal after scandal, and, racism, uh, corruption, and uh, other scandals that we've seen. And in conditions of scarcity, where workers are facing very real material struggles with things like public services being cut to the bone, a lack of affordable housing, huge queues for healthcare, 
and so on. There are some workers who will buy into this use of the race card by the media and political parties, especially when there's not any viable political alternative exposing the fact that it is capitalism that cannot give us the adequate basics of life. This explains why, for example, there have been a layer of workers who have supported parties such as UKIP in the past, a party which uh, basically appears to offer something different gains ground because it appears on the surface as more anti-establishment, even if part of that is by uh, kind of um, pandering to, to racist prejudices. But that is, uh, there is also a curse in this uh, for the ruling class because it means by using the race card and promising to attack immigrant rights so that you know, British workers can get more jobs, more housing, uh, better healthcare, higher wages, and all of this, um, these attempts must always fail and they eventually do lose support because, again, it's capitalism that cannot provide these things. But if we had a fighting leadership putting forward a bold programme which actually took up the issue uh, of unemployment, austerity uh, and a lack of housing with policies like nationalisation, uh, this would completely cut the ground under uh, these parties which, which do pander to racist prejudices. So in 2015, for example, Jeremy Corbyn's anti-austerity uh, message resonated with millions and uh, a YouGov poll actually found that he was the, the first choice for many uh, and apparently even 62% of UKIP voters who took part in this poll thought the same thing. And the poll stated, Corbyn supporters represent a longing for an alternative that has an appeal far beyond the left of the Labour Party. So this shows that even a, you know, the small number of workers who voted UKIP did so largely uh, due to wanting kind of fundamental change in society. So we should be clear, uh, the causes for the problems facing workers are not migrants. And events of, of the last few years have actually shown us that there is a real like, growing mood of solidarity against the racist actions of the state uh, towards migrants in, Bre uh, in Britain that shows the revolutionary potential that does exist uh, amongst workers who are completely disgusted by the status quo. So home office uh, deportations uh, and raids have been actively stopped by um, neighbours and activists in places around the UK. Um, there's a good example of uh, Glasgow in May 2021, where two men were, were detained by uh, an immigration, uh, a set of immigration officers. They were put into a van uh, on the basis that they had no right to be in the UK. And uh, instead of letting them be taken away, neighbours kind of trickled out onto the road. This also uh, happened at a time where local, um, a local mosque uh, had like Eid prayers finishing. So you had people kind of slowly trickling out from that as well, people looking out from their windows. And there are even reports that uh, some people from shops nearby were bringing uh, trays of food and refreshments. So it shows what the mood was like. And someone there said, uh, we were aware then that we could have been arrested, but what was at the front of our minds was don't be coming into our communities and taking away people who live here. <clears throat> and we had another immigration raid in Peckham in London uh, earlier this year, taking away a Nigerian man uh, who was put in a van on the grounds that he had overstayed his visa. Neighbours and activists came together to protest. There was even a report that parents from uh, a WhatsApp group of a local primary school were organising a NAT to come to the protest. Uh, and the crowd ended up staying for four hours until uh, he was released. And then they chanted to the police, don't come back to Peckham. So what this shows us is that in the face of uh, common attacks on living and working conditions, National differences between workers can lose any real significance. <clears throat> so um, the enemy of, of the working class is, is not migrant labour, and it is the, the response uh, or it is the responsibility of the labour movement to involve these layers in the struggle as much as possible. 
there's a, an example of uh, a deportation attempt in Dalston in London last year, targeting food delivery drivers. Uh, and the Industrial Workers Union of Great Britain uh, is helping to uh, organise these couriers uh, around the demands for you know, right to work safety and the union has actually responded with militancy to these deportation threats. And it showed that these attacks have come about at a time where the drivers were trying to get organised uh, and were trying to fight back against the bosses. And the union exposed the hypocrisy of the bosses, that it was just at this point that they were also being threatened with deportation. Now, a response like this in the labour movement is more likely to galvanise workers facing the same conditions, the tide is blowing in their favour. And every attack serves to show the real interests of the workers on the one hand and the capitalists on the other cutting across these divisions set up by the capitalists. Now, we should be clear that this differs from uh, some on the reformist left who have fallen into the trap of this division by calling for uh, more humane and efficient borders, uh, which really just make, like, needs making immigration policy nicer. And uh, the Labour Manifesto in 2019 under Corbyn was a textbook example of this. Because when he was uh, asked whether there would be free movement, he said there will be a lot of movement. So we should make no mistake, what this shamefully boils down to uh, is maintaining restrictions on migration with a kind of odd tweak here and there. Uh, in this case, it was to expand the rights of migrants to bring family members to the UK. Others on the reformist left have called for managed migration to protect uh, so-called uh, native workers. Uh, Len McCluskey, uh, who is a, a former leader of the Unite Union here, argued that uh, free movement undercuts wages for British workers. And the result is that he was in favour of a tighter immigration policy. So these ideas of the reformists are not new, and in fact they have existed for a long time. It's just been kind of drawn out and exposed more and more now that we're facing you know, imperialist wars, uh, like war after war, uh, poverty all over the world, climate change, which is really like pushing these things to the fore. <clears throat> Now, um, we can look to the past to see this. Um, the second international, which came out of the first international, which was founded by Marx and Engels, uh, was made of socialist parties from across the world. And the international, the second international, was born in a period of capitalist upswing. Uh, so the leadership came under the pressures of capitalism, living in a way that was divorced from the class struggle and they moved in an increasingly reformist direction because of this. So um, at their conference in 1907, you could see the different trends uh, that existed in the labor movement and have always existed uh, on the questions of colonization, war, imperialism, and migration. For example, uh, there was a debate on the question of immigration, which had two opposite poles, uh, a wing from Britain, the US and Germany, uh, arguing in favour of colonies as a kind of civilising uh, force. And uncoincidentally, they then argued against immigration from countries that were too far behind in their development. But there was also a wing that had better elements in it, explaining that immigration controls were bad, uh, and in the end, they won this. The majority agreed to uh, the fact that migration controls should be regarded as reactionary by nature. So they proposed a series of measures to actually strengthen the labour movement. And this included the abolition of uh, restrictions, preventing people from various nationalities from staying uh, in a country or which excluded them from the social, political, uh, and economic rights of you know, so-called natives. And I think this really strikes at the heart of how we should fight for open borders. You know, it shows that the struggle, uh, the struggle of migrants to, to move about freely uh, and settle as they wish, 
uh, is not separate from the class struggle. And genuine Marxists have always been in favour of this, as shown by the revolutionary wing at the Congress. So, as I said, we are internationalists. We believe that the downward spiral of wages, uh, working conditions, living conditions, uh, access to basic services and so on has to be fought by workers irrespective of nationality, skin colour, what language you speak and so on. Lenin actually describes this process as requiring workers of all countries to come together in a single international force for emancipation. So any attempt to break down national barriers and prejudices against fellow workers uh, is a progressive act. It shows that our struggle is one and the same. Now, the protests in response to the immigration raids in Glasgow and Peckham show us one part of this, I think, with workers moving spontaneously to protect workers in their neighbourhoods. You know, this is a positive development, and it's the embryo of what the wider struggle can be, as it also needs a firm uh, class perspective to guide it uh, beyond this. So Marxists in the labour movement should uh, have an uncompromising stance uh, against any restrictions to the integration of migrants. Uh, we have to show, for example, that the struggle for housing is also a struggle to expropriate the empty homes of tycoons, uh, a struggle to expropriate uh, the housing monopolies that build homes for profit, uh, because we can ensure that everyone has a decent place to live. And we must show uh, that the struggle for a healthcare system that meets everyone's needs uh, is inseparable from the struggle against austerity and the drive of the capitalists for privatisation to drive up their profits. And in fighting this, in fighting for open borders as part of the struggle of the working class against the capitalist class, it becomes clear that we cannot do away with borders and the racist divisions uh, used against workers without getting rid of the capitalist class completely. So only in the overthrow of capitalism will we see an end to this, not only through workers' control of the media uh, and so on, uh, meaning no funding from the rich which supports their worldview, uh, but also for material changes in life with housing for all, access to you know, all basic needs uh, like enough food, healthcare, education, employment, and overthrowing the profit motive, replacing it with a system built around production on the basis of need, uh, it would do away with brutal imperialist wars, do away with climate change, away with poverty, meaning that all the reasons why people have to move in uh, the first place, be, you know, beyond their control, could be done away with. So people will be able to, to move and settle as they wish, uh, easily integrating into that society and, you know, easily being able to integrate into the planning of production wherever uh, they, they choose to go. And we should be clear that this is not a utopia, uh, but it's a real potential that exists. You know, we have uh, the resources to feed over 10 billion people. We have the technology, the potential infrastructure. Um, we have the immense skills acquired by the working class. Uh, we have everything we need to provide everyone with a dignified life. It's just in the private hands uh, of a minority of humanity, which is the capitalist class. So we say that migrants are welcome, down with capitalism and the fundamental cause of war and suffering for millions. Uh, and we firmly take up what Marx said, which is workers of the world unite.